but um, it's a bit, or, or it's a bit like your favourite children, I think, with something like Partridge. Coogan and the teams around him have done so much unbelievably brilliant work since then, since the start of the 90s till now. It's just a matter of what you feel like at that particular time, you know. I do love surreal early Chris Morris Allen. Um, I love that sort of bouncing back era Allen very much, the Travel Tavern Allen, because it, and that North Norfolk digital stuff. Because a lot of it's sort of... Uh, the, the older I get, the more I realise that I am a sort of l- like a, a real life ver- IRL version of Alan in a lot of ways, <laughs> um, and that that is almost a joke, but not a joke at the same time. Um, <laughs> you know, just just looking back on things like seeing Alan, should I say Steve and Chris Morris do that interview about you know when he upset the farmers, mm. and hearing all all that sort of flowery Chris Morris language come back into Alan's universe again he's, he's fantastic you know the sort of uh, spinal column on a bap um, you know he get and he gets the cow dropped on him um, so I love all that surreal stuff but I do love I do love it, every iteration because it's like watching somebody's life and, it, and I love what they've done with him that they've, he's so woven into our lives that he's I worry about Steve Coogan genuinely I was talking to Nina Conti about this last week I did, I did a, an interview with her the great the phenomenal ventriloquist and comedian, and we were talking about the the, the psych the psychology of what it's like to do her job, and how these characters are, are versions of or levels of her own personality. And I was just postulating how difficult it is going to be at some point in the future if Steve ever decides to kill off Alan. It's like Alan is so much of a person now that there would be a genuine bereavement. And not just for Steve Coogan, I think for all of us, we'd all be like, what the... Alan's died. <laughs> I, I probably need to take... I mean, I, I'm taking probably about a year off work at the moment by accident, but I, I probably would have to just like lie under a duvet for a month if Alan died. So, very long and pointless answer to the question. Uh, there is no favourite part of that that whole universe. It's just I love living in it. That's fair. I mean, and it's yeah, it's interesting to your point about that he is basically a fully formed person. That you know, there's an archivist somewhere that's written up his timeline, and obviously there's an autobiography that covers more or less every inch of everything he's ever done. And also, if they ever do decide to can it, it will feel, it, you know, in some senses, it will feel a bit like a genuine bereavement, but it'll also feel a bit like a murder because someone's got to decide to do it yeah, at some point as that's well. That's true. And, you know, it's, it's almost it's going to feel like a selfish act. I think when, yeah. when we see Steve pull the plug on something that everybody loves so much. I, th- um, I I wonder if he's thought about it. I don't know if you guys have talked to him, but you know, I wonder if he has in his head that he wouldn't tell anybody a sort of yeah, yeah either he dies with me, you know, he dies when I die, or if he yeah. thinks if I make it to seventy, that's when I'm that's when I'm throwing him in the in the grave, you know. Yeah, like a partridge end game, if you will. Yeah. I mean knowing what, what we do know of Steve, I would say I think I think the latter part's definitely true. I can't imagine yeah. him wanting to hand the reins over of the yeah, property to anyone that's else. True. I think he's very protective of Brand Partridge, but yeah, whether he's got a, whether he's got an idea in mind of you know this is how he's going to die and this is when it's going to happen, I don't know. It's really interesting. I wonder whether they, whether Steve or any of Steve and the writing team have ever considered killing him off because, you know, you could imagine maybe. I don't know, late 90s, early 2000s, they might have toyed with that idea possibly. But I think, you know, on reflection now, they'd be very pleased that they haven't. Yeah. Because you look at like, there's been so much more Partridge that has happened post mm. I'm Alan Partridge that perhaps people would never have expected. Do you know it, what it I think of- would be poetic? And I hope I hope this isn't making light of a, a, of a dark situation. <laughs> but for him to take a leaf out of Bowie's book and to, yeah. have, to have the death of Partridge recorded and locked in yeah. for for release when when steve himself goes <laughs> i bet he's i you I know you said it i bet that's what he's done it's like <laughs> you're right though it's like the rich stuff that's come recently you know i got covid for christmas last year right that's what i what got for christmas yeah. yeah 22nd of december <clears throat> 23rd of december you've got covid 24th of mm. december i lost my taste and smell um, and, and it was it, the reason that, the only reason I mention this, apart from the fact that I always mention it because I'm always looking for, for sympathy, is that one of the things that got me through it was the Beastie Boys documentary, uh, listening to ill communication for some reason, um, and, but also uh, Alan Partridge from the Oast House, uh, you know, the Audible uh, series. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I, I did think, for, as, as somebody who's toyed with radio comedy in some ways, 
in different iterations myself, the 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 level of production on that and the the, the quality of it and the and the depth. And I know that I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here big time, in it, but the depth of um, of character in it, it's just. It's, it's just breathtaking, really. I'm just like God, like you say, Tom. It's like thank, I bet they thank the lucky, the, the God that they they never knocked it on the head back in the day because he can react to everything, can't? He? It's like on this time, he's all that post me too, Alan. Alan trying to fit in like a you know like a sort of into modern society and failing mm, mm. utterly and miserably. He's just <laughs> so much comedy gold. It, but then it's I do also think that it's. It's weird to watch as long as Richard Madeley is still with us. How I said that maybe I'm a bit Alan. Richard Madeley is Alan Partridge for real, isn't he? But like 18 times stronger. Mm. And it's at sort of the points now where their paths have crossed in so many ways. It's hard to know who's playing off who yeah. at some points. It's like, know, Jer- like, like I, I, has- know, I know Jeremy Vine, of course, because I used to use him a lot on my show and we're friends. So I think you wouldn't mind me saying this, but he's another one who I think has identified. Oh, I do sound a little bit like parody-ish sometimes when I'm saying things, don't I? I think I'll cross, I'll transgress that line, and and now I haven't got a fucking clue anymore. When when he's taking the piss out of us, or when he's doing it without thinking, you know, it's just like it's the yeah. partridge thing has infected us all. Well, it feels like early doors, the, the Noel Edmonds and the Bill Oddies of this world that were getting referenced on Partridge, you know, were very careful to distance themselves. But now it feels like it's such an institution that's been around for 30 years. People who are a bit Partridge are, are actively leaning into it. Yeah, leaning into Partridge. Do you think Do you think someone like Richard Madeley knows what he's doing in that respect, though? I, I do, because he seems like such a kind of... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I I just feel like he literally. You, you never know what he's going to say next no. when he's broadcasting. I, I, I wonder th- whether it's calculated or he's just that much of a kind of madcap entity. I think you. I, well, I think I wouldn't be surprised if. And again, you people who 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 are devotees of this will know better than me. But if if Steve Coogan fed a bit of Medley into the front in, in, into Partridge anyway, so it's that way around. But yeah, mm, I think Richard mm, Medley is so yeah. uh, you know Judy and I, you know, uh, making love, and uh, we like, like to listen to the Beastie Boys, and uh, sometimes I give us something to bite down on, and uh, that's just the way we do it, you know, and it's fantastic. Anyway, coming up after the break, uh, Gina uh, DeCampo is going to show us how to make churros. You know, it's that that whole that that was already there, so I th- I'm pretty sure that he's been fed into Alan. But no, it's like a fucking yeah. human centipede, and Richard Medley has consumed so much Alan Partridge, he doesn't know who he is anymore. I think that's a really interesting point. There's definitely a kind of um, a self-fulfilling uh, nature of the character in terms of, I guess, in the very early TV iteration, something like Knowing Me, Knowing You, I think that very much lent into things like Wogan and stuff yeah. like that. So you do kind of go with the the perhaps the key broadcasting uh, kind of qualities of the day, I, I, I guess. So yeah, that that does kind of make sense that it isn't just... It isn't just broadcasters being, I'm going to copy that. It's also Coogan and the writing team going, this is what's happening in the world of broadcasting these days. This is what we need to bring into it. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. It's it's like, it's the same in my game, you know, in radio broadcasting. Every, it's The same thing could be said of Smashy and Nicey in, in the early 90s, you know, sort of uh, White House and Enfield creating those characters that were so not perfect DLTs, Tony Blackburns, mm. etc. And, and of course, to the extent that they took parts of those people's, um, the things that they'd done and sort of lampooned them. And, and it's very difficult then to remember which, which one happened on the TV show and which one happened in real life. They've mixed it all together so perfectly. And now, 20, 30 years along the line, if you, especially if you listen to Radio 2 a lot of the time, um, it's like culture has digested Smashy and Nicey and uh, these these DJs and presenters have not all of them, some of them they shall remain nameless, and um, and it's almost like they're they're doing smashy and nicey themselves, but in a post ironic way, like we, it's just it's very confusing to know where, where real life begins and where fantasy starts. But then I'm, that's my my whole life's confused like that. <laughs> that's why I'm sitting here dressed as a fucking unicorn. <laughs> 